The last week has seen dramatic U.S. escalations against Iran, setting the stage for the most dangerous war footing between the two countries for decades. We all watched in horror the chain of events. The predictable death of an American contractor, illegal U.S. airstrikes killing 25 Iraqis in response, the mass protest at the U.S. Embassy. Then came the audacious and criminal assassination of General Soleimani as he arrived at the Baghdad airport for peace negotiations, followed by a calculated and de-escalatory Iranian response that avoided killing any Americans. We also saw thousands of Americans come out into the streets in nearly 100 cities and towns to protest the path to war. Things have seemingly de-escalated for now, but the threat of full-scale war still looms under an administration run by impulsive, war-hungry extremists. Trump has promised to increase sanctions, deployed tens of thousands more military personnel, and has sent nuclear-armed aircraft to patrol the region. This perilous game is nothing new. In fact, the U.S. has been waging war against Iran for nearly 70 years in the forms of coups, assassinations, and deadly sanctions. And the events of last week should serve as a wake-up call for how quickly the Pentagon could trigger the devastating war we all fear. To counter the war propaganda and get the crucial context of U.S.-Iran tensions, I sat down with journalist and human rights attorney Dan Kavalik, author of the book, The Plot to Attack Iran, How the CIA and the Deep State Have Conspired to Vilify Iran. So Dan, we're on the brink of war with Iran under the Trump administration. There's been several provocations over the last few weeks that have taken us closer to that reality. Can you get us up to speed about what has happened? Yes. So really, uh, I think the beginning of the tensions began with uh, Trump backing out of the nuclear deal that uh, President Obama had made with Iran. Under this deal, Iran was limited in how much it could um, enrich uranium uh, to prevent it from uh, enriching it to the point of, of, of weapons grade. And in return, the U.S. would lift sanctions that it had imposed on Iran some time ago. Um, while everyone agrees that Iran had been complying with that treaty, uh, had kept the enrichment within the limits set forth. Uh, in May of 2018, uh, Donald Trump unilaterally backed out of the agreement, uh, be making it clear that he wanted more from Iran than just uh, complying with the nuclear deal, that he wanted other, essentially to contain Iran in other ways. And so that began the kind of causes uh, belli uh, for Iran to react, but the incredible thing was Iran didn't react at all for about a year. Because Europe had promised, Europe was also signatory to the nuclear deal. And Europe said, hey, they're complying. We want them to comply. We're going to salvage the nuclear deal. We're going to make sure that uh, Iran is able to continue trade. It's not impacted by the U.S. sanctions. And uh, we're going to keep uh, the deal going, but Europe did not, either could not or would not do that. And Iran saw that and finally said, you know, uh, okay, well, the deal's dead. And uh, they said they would start enriching uh, their uranium uh, beyond the, li the, the, the limits they had at that point uh, gotten up to. Uh, but if I could just say a couple things about that. Um, Iran has always made it clear they don't want nuclear weapons. The Ayatollah of Iran issued a fatwa, a religious edict, in fact, saying that the creation, stockpiling, and use of nuclear weapons is contrary to Islam. And so he said that they would never uh, create nuclear weapons, that they never intended to, that they only want this for energy. And we have to recall that back in the 50s, the U.S. and the General Electric Company began helping Iran under the Shah nuclear, nuclearize Iran. And so uh, the U.S. has known for a long time that Iran needed to nuclear energy 
um, to, to help sustain its electrical grids. And that's what this is about. In any case, Iran said, look, you know, we've been maintaining these certain levels of enrichment. Now we're going to start increasing them because you're, the deal's dead. Uh, but then the U.S. ginned up, and I think it's fair to say ginned up this, this claim that Iran was going, that they had intelligence Iran was going to attack U.S. targets in Syria. This began the escalation in the Persian Gulf. This was around, again, May 2019. So the U.S., in response, sends nuclear-capable uh, bombers, B-52 bombers, to the Persian Gulf, uh, aircraft uh, strike teams, and uh, Patriot missile batteries as well uh, to the Gulf to threaten Iran in response to this alleged intelligence. And what are these attacks, alleged attacks, on these oil tankers? Uh, one was a Saudi oil tanker. Another one, I think, was it a Japanese oil tanker? Yeah, there was a Japanese. Uh, I believe there was uh, the one, yes, yeah, some Saudi. I believe one also from... Uh, uh, the UAE. Which also kind of are questionable, right? They're very I mean, questionable. Coming from the Trump administration. Yeah, well, uh, and again, you you have to look at each, each alleged attack on its own merits. But for example, the alleged attack on the Japanese vessel, uh, it was very inconvenient for the Trump administration that the people who owned the tanker said it didn't happen. <laughs> and in fact, the only videotape they have is of Iranian Revolutionary Guardsmen helping remove bombs from the tanker, <laughs> not putting them on. Um, and at the time that that allegedly happened to the Japanese tanker, uh, Iran was having high-level negotiations with Japan, seeking them to intervene with the United States to help lower tensions. So why would they attack a Japanese vessel at that point? It makes no sense. The, there was the other episode where, where Iran did shoot down an unmanned drone. Uh, there was some disagreement whether the drone was in international waters or Iranian waters. You know, but Iran's position was, look, it's a military you know, instrument. We don't know what they're doing with it. We don't know if it's just a spy drone or if it has weapons, and they shot it down. You know. Um, and, and you may recall that in response, Trump ordered a uh, military assault. And then was applauded for Iran. calling it off. Right, and then yeah. he called it off, I guess 10 minutes, within 10 minutes of them striking. And Iran, for its part, Iran claimed they could have shot down a manned U.S. aircraft that was heading towards them, but did not. If the U.S. were to attack Iran, if the U.S., in Iran war to get into a conventional war, and I pray to God it is conventional, not nuclear. Um, you know, there's been estimates, for example, by retired Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, that the cost in lives and treasure would be 10 times greater than the war with Iraq. So you're looking at millions of dead and trillions spent on that war. Uh, it would be catastrophic. And it could be a, war, a world war because, uh, you know, both Russia and China depend on Iranian oil. So it really risks a greater conflagration, which we should all be concerned about. Let's talk about sanctions. Yeah. Obviously, Trump didn't start the sanctions against Iran, but he's certainly ramped them up to genocidal levels at this right. point. Uh, talk about the history of sanctions against Iran, what Trump has done to exacerbate this and what effects they're having on the civilian population. Yes, well, uh, so under Obama, under the nuclear deal, uh, Obama did decrease sanctions to some extent, did allow some more trade uh, with Iran, although not fully. The Iranians claim, and when I was there in 2017, a lot of Iranians complained to me that while they lived up to their part of the deal, Obama never fully lifted the sanctions he had promised to. But he had lifted them a little bit, giving them some a little bit of ease and a little bit of ability to get their economy uh, uh, ramped up again. But then once Trump backed out of the JCOP, uh, which is what the nuclear deal is called, and increased sanctions, then he went back to the pre-nuclear deal levels of sanctions, which really, and vowed that he would not allow Iran to sell any oil. And of course, 
oil is the mainstay of the Iranian economy. And the U.S. has, uh, you know, kept to that promise largely. It has really cut down on Iran's ability to sell oil around the world, has economically isolated it. Iran is not able to buy foodstuffs that it needs to import. It has uh, been unable to buy medicines and raw materials for medicines that itself makes. And so people are dying in Iran from hunger, from lack of medicines. Uh, at least two children died because they could not get uh, organ transplants. So it is a very serious thing. This is really an act of terrorism against the Iranian people. Terrorism, as we most people understand it, being an attack against the civilian population for a political end. Well, here they're attacking the civilian population for the political end of trying to encourage the population to overthrow the Islamic Republic. Trump officials claim that Iran poses a serious threat to the U.S. What threat do you really think Iran does pose to the U.S. empire? Because yes. we know obviously there is no threat to the civilian population here. But what is this warmongering really about, Dan? Well, I think, uh, first of all, let me just say what it isn't about. Mm -hmm. Explain it a little further. Why is Iran not a, a threat militarily? Uh, because a lot of people do believe it is, of course, uh, particularly in the U.S. Your average U.S. citizen probably believes Iran is a military threat of some kind. Um, in fact, Iran, the interesting thing about Iran is that they actually partnered with the U.S. in the war on terror after 9-11. Iran offered to help George W. Bush fight the Taliban in Afghanistan go after al-Qaeda, and Iran did both things. And actually, the, the, the Bush White House applauded Iran for this until Bush, uh, out of the air, says Iran was part of some axis of evil with Iraq, which, of course, was a mortal enemy of Iran, people have to remember. Mm -hmm. So the idea it was in any alliance with Iraq was ridiculous, and with North Korea. Um, which was very upsetting to the Iranians because they thought that after 9-11, after they helped fight al-Qaeda, which was a mortal enemy of Iran, by the way, um, that there was a chance for normalizing relations with the U.S. So the point is Iran is not a threat to the United States. In fact, it is a potential ally in, in many ways. Um, but what threat does it pose? Uh, first of all, uh, the United States never forgave Iran for overthrowing the Shah back in 1979. The U.S. had installed the Shah in 1953, had overthrown a democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, installed the Shah, helped create something called the SAVAK, which was a security service that had tentacles throughout Iranian society, used torture to, to rule that society. And um, the Iranian people overthrew the Shah in 1979. Well, this was a bad example. This was the danger of, of, well, what some would say a good example to show that people can overthrow a U.S.-backed dictatorship and can challenge U.S. hegemony. And the Iranians did this. Um, and so ever since that time, the U.S. wanted Iran back within its sphere of influence. Because the Shah from 1953 to 1979 was the U.S.'s bulldog in the Middle East, along with Israel. Uh, the Shah was the U.S.'s enforcer. And so then it lost Iran. Iran became uh, a perceived adversary at that point, uh, but certainly wasn't within the sphere of the U.S. political and, and economic influence. And Iran has been a leader of the non-aligned movement uh, as well. The movement which today really means not being aligned with the United States. Um, at one time, it, it meant more not being aligned with the U.S. or the Soviet Union. And so really, it's Iran's independence that really galls the United States. That it is willing to use its own oil for its own purposes. Uh, without U.S. companies being allowed to profit from that or control their oil. That is really the threat of Iran. Uh, 
I think the other threat of Iran uh, is that the U.S. and Israel have designs to expand territorial control within the Middle East, this idea of the greater Israel. And Iran really stands in the way of this. Um, Syria does as well, and they thought they were going to knock Syria off, and that didn't happen. Um, so they see both Syria and Iran's as impediment to that goal as well. And I think the one thing that people should think about is, the f it, it, is that things have changed fairly recently with regard to the U.S.'s designs on other people's oil. So for a long time, for example, Jimmy Carter announced what is known as the Carter Doctrine, that if any country would interfere with the U.S.'s access to oil in the Persian Gulf, he announced the U.S. would have the right to militarily intervene to defend U.S.'s access to oil. Well, the truth is the U.S. doesn't need any access to anyone's oil now. The U.S. is a net exporter of both oil and natural gas uh, because we found more oil, we're willing to drill more, particularly under Trump, I guess we're now willing to, draw, to drill more in Alaska, for example, and because of fracking. The point being, we don't need Iranian oil, nor do we need Venezuelan oil. And so I think while the U.S. would like compliant states in countries like Iran and Venezuela so that U.S. companies could profit from their oil, a second best scenario from the U.S. point of view is to simply knock them off as competitors, simply pre prevent them from producing any oil at all. And that would allow the U.S. to gain more profit, of course, from the sale of the oil and natural gas. And so I think what people need to realize is the U.S. would be just as happy to destroy those countries as it would to control them. And we see this more and more over the years. We see this with the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, particularly Libya, where the U.S. seems simply content to wreck a state and walk away from it um, and to get ri rid of competitors that way, which is a pretty nefarious uh, uh, goal. Trump also says that Iran is the world's largest financier of terrorism. Uh, what evidence do you think they have to support that outrageous allegation? Seems odd considering the role that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia play. Yes, well, yeah, it's a very um, skewed view of, of terrorism. Again, if we talk about the terrorists that have attacked us, Al-Qaeda, for example, um, they are mostly backed by Saudi Arabia and at times have been backed by the United States, as has ISIS. And so if that's a terrorist we're talking about, in fact, Iran is a mortal enemy of those groups. When the U.S. says Iran is a backer of terrorism, what they mean is that they support Hezbollah in Lebanon and they support Hamas in Palestine. But I think most honest political experts do not view those groups as terrorist groups. They're both elected. And they're both elected. But again, the U.S. doesn't care about elections, yeah. right? Unless it elects the people that we think supports our interests. The U.S. now supports 73% of the world's dictatorships, some of which the U.S. actually put into power. And again, look at Saudi Arabia, which is a monarchy. It's repressive. It beheads people. Um, it supports al-Qaeda. It is engaged in a genocidal war in Yemen right now. And the U.S. has no problem not just tolerating them, but even, you know, arming them to the teeth. So I think the idea that Iran is a supporter of terrorism just is not true. I mean, really what the U.S. resents is that Iran would deign to try to have any influence within its own region of the world. Of course they have that right. If you look at a map, Iran is bordered by about 17 different countries, most of which are hostile and most of which have U.S. military bases. You know, it's Iran that's under attack, let's face it. And it's just this bizarre thing that the U.S. can go to the Persian Gulf, send military uh, uh, vessels there, military equipment, 
and somehow say Iran is threatening us. Can you imagine if Iran <laughs> had military vessels on the coast of New York City or San Francisco or something? I mean, it's just out of the question. The U.S.'s position is it governs the world and has dominion over the world. And a country like Iran can't even have a little influence over its own region of the world, which is just crazy. Dan, you mentioned that you were in Iran on the ground in 2017. That was, I think, one of the more fascinating aspects of your book, uh, The Plot to Attack Iran. And I wanted to go over a couple of these kind of misconceptions about the country that in general. Um, you know, I was surprised to learn that Iran has the largest state-sponsored condom factory in the Middle East. Yes. Yes. Um, they they make, yeah, they make condoms of all colors and varieties <laughs> and flavors. I think pink being the most favorite color uh, that they make. Uh, they also have one of the biggest um, uh, medical, uh, they're one of the biggest medical survivors uh, or providers for uh, uh, gender reassignment as well. And it has the second highest population of Jews in the Middle East next to Israel, which is a fascinating contradiction considering Netanyahu and, of course, Israeli leadership's rhetoric saying that Jews need to emigrate you know, is Iranian Jews need to emigrate to Israel because, of course, this genocidal anti-Semitism right. that's being parroted by the Iranian leadership. I mean, how do you reconcile that contradiction here? Yeah, no, it's just not true. I mean, the Iranians are proud of being a very pluralistic society with Jews, uh, Christians, particularly Armenian Christians, uh, Zoroastrians, which are an ancient religion. Um, Again, this is based on a misconception. In fact, as I mentioned in my book, there's a Jewish-run hospital in Tehran, which the Iranian government itself has given millions of dollars to. And uh, the Iranians living, or the Jews living in Iran, you know, who've been uh, polled and been interviewed, say they're happy to be there. And they're not leaving uh, Iran. When I went to Isfahan, which is in the center of Iran. It's an ancient city. Um, you know, I just happened to be in one of the bazaars shopping, and uh, I saw a shopkeeper with a yarmulke on. And I went up to him and said, oh, wow, you know, uh, you know, are you Jewish? He said, yeah, and how do you like living here? And he said, oh, it's great. And I said, well, is there a synagogue in town? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, about a mile up this road. So we walked a mile up the road <laughs> and went to the synagogue. In fact, right after the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who's very vilified in this country, actually issued a fatwa ordering uh, the Iranian people to protect the Jews within Iran, uh, which is quite interesting. And also, interestingly enough, you mentioned that they have the second highest rate or I guess allegedly, of alcohol consumption, despite it being a dry country. So officially it's illegal, but apparently uh, everyone has alcohol in their homes. You know, so it's not the backward country um, that people think it is. And women actually have, uh, you know, a pretty good place in Iranian society and, and are active in all segments of the Iranian economy. And, uh, and the education of everyone, including girls and women, is highly valued there. And you will see uh, Iranian women who compete around the world in terms of being great scientists and that sort of thing. Well, and Tehran is especially modern. I remember seeing Oddly enough, an episode of The Daily Show where Jon Stewart went to Tehran many, many years ago and everyone was like, oh, Jon Stewart, we love you. <laughs> he was like, how do you know who I am? <laughs> it seems like they're very well versed in U.S. society, as you mentioned in your book. They can distinguish American people from the evil government, you know, the evil U.S. empire that's, that's facilitating all these horrible um, acts of aggression against their country. They can distinguish you are different from, you know, our government. Yes. Why are we not able to do that to them? 
Yeah, well, it's interesting, and I find that around the world. I find if you go to Venezuela, the Venezuelans are able to do it. The Nicaraguans are able to do it. The Cubans are able to do it. Again, the Iranians are able to do it. In fact, most in most of those countries, they love Americans. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in Iran, if they find out you're American, people are like, oh, if they know some English, they want to try it out on you. They want to show you that they know English. They want a photo. I think it's the different societies. I mean, frankly, I find American people in general to be the most ideologized people in the world. We think we have a free press and a, mm -hmm. that our education system is really great and that it doesn't propagandize us, but that's just not true. You know, we've been led to believe uh, that we're an exceptional nation, uh, that we are unique in our freedoms and our democracy, and that we have the right, therefore, to spread democracy and freedom around the world, even if that we have to kill a million people in a place like Iraq to do it. Mm -hmm. um, most countries in the world don't think that way. They're just happy if they're left alone. They don't have designs on controlling the world. But we do. And, and, and when I say we, and sometimes I'm criticized for using the collective we, because people say, well, it, that's the government, you know, it's not us. But I do think collectively, most of us think we have the right to run the world. And that's the problem. And that's why we're able to be led into one war after another, because on some level, we believe this. Certainly, and we have a responsibility that's unique as well of being you know, the children of the empire. We have the agency to do something about this. Um, and so the people were very gracious. They were very hospitable. I was surprised to learn that there's actually quite a large safety net um, a societal safety net in terms of maternity leave, other social services, certainly more than, you know, the richest country in the history of the world, this country has. Yes. Yeah, the Ayatollah, you know, the Ayatollah and the mullahs in um, Iran, which again are heavily criticized, the one thing about them is they do believe in servicing the poor. They think that that is part of uh, Islamic values. And so, uh, medicine uh, is largely free in that country. Uh, food is provided to people who can't get their own food. It does have a very strong social safety net. And again, this is seen as very consistent with uh, their Islamic values. And by and large, even now that I think back on it, when I, you know, when I spent some time in Tehran and, and Isfahan, I mean, I just didn't see the kind of poverty that I see in this country, in, in cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, you know, which are considered like world-class cities. And they are now starting to resemble things that I see more in the third world, you know, but not in Iran. But the sad part of it is, of course, that um, these sanctions, which have been going on a long time in one form or another, are making it very hard to take care of people in Iran. Let's go back a little bit in time um, to provide some context to the tensions between the U.S. and Iran today. I know that you briefly mentioned the history, but let's dig a little deeper, going back to Sykes-Picot. Well, the interesting part is that Iran is one of the only countries in the Middle East that pretty much looks today like it has always looked. It is one of the countries that was not overrun uh, by the West and carved out. And so Iran has largely been a, a unit, unified state and country for 4,000 years, which is quite incredible. And that's what makes Iran quite special because a lot of these countries are not real countries in the sense that they were created from without, largely by the West, largely by Britain. Um, but Iran, which was known as Persia, uh, didn't have that history uh, of being taken over. Moreover, they've never had a history of attacking other countries. You know, in 4,000 years, they've never started a war against someone else. Uh, so that's what makes Iran unique 
And frankly, from the point of view of people who value history, who value um, you know, antiquities, and, and frankly, our own beginnings in our own history, um, Iran is very important to preserve because they have incredible uh, buildings and ruins and antiquities um, that really go back thousands of years. Um, and most of the countries in the Middle East by now have suffered a great destruction to those types of antiquities, mostly because of the wars uh, that the U.S. have brought and Britain. But that's not to say that Iran, uh, you know, was not a victim of Briti particularly British colonialization, which began in the late 20, in the late 19th century. Iran was essentially controlled by the British Empire yes. at that time. Talk about what Iran was like in this era and why Iran's oil was so essential for Britain to expand its uh, territory around the world. Yes, yeah, so uh, Iran, oil was discovered in Iran in 1908. And uh, again, this is just as um, the world is starting to use oil for fuel, for uh, combustible um, engines. And Britain, as you say, needed that oil uh, to build its own military up, its own navy. And so it had designs on Iranian oil as soon as that was discovered there in 1908. And very shortly after that, uh, Britain took control of Iran's oil fields uh, through something known as the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. Uh, through the Anglo-Persian uh, uh, Oil Company, Britain controlled uh, the production of Iranian oil used mostly British personnel to uh, work on the oil production in Iran. And m most importantly, Britain was the one that profited most from that oil. Meanwhile, about 90% of Iran was living in abject poverty, literally in rags, because all the profits were going out the door to Great Britain which caused a great amount of consternation. Some of them were living in the oil fields themselves. I mean, some of these workers. Yes. Yes, they were treated as near slaves. And um, kind of the height of British oppression of Iran happened between 1917 and 1919 when Britain contributed to a famine in Iran, which killed about eight to 10 million Iranians. It's actually considered one of the greatest genocides of the 20th century by people who know it happened, though not a lot of people do. Um, and so uh, Britain controlled Iranian oil for its own benefit until 1951. So between about 1910 and 1951, Iranian oil was controlled for the benefit of Britain. And let's talk about how Mohammad Mosaddegh came to power um, democratically. What were the circumstances, not only in Iran, um, that saw him rise to power, but also around the world? Yes, well, after World War II, there was a very strong process of decolonization throughout the world. Uh, countries around the world were beginning to demand uh, their liberation from domination, again, particularly from Britain, uh, but also Germany, France, uh, Portugal. And at this time, Iran starts to demand its independence from Great Britain. And so in 1951, Mohammad Mosaddegh is elected the prime minister of Iran. And part of the democratization of Iran and part of the struggle for anti-colonialization was nationalizing the oil fields, which is exactly what Prime Minister Mosaddegh did with the support of the parliament. He nationalized the oil fields and took them away from Great Britain. Did offer compensation for that, uh, but was never able to work out a deal before he was finally overthrown two years later in 1953. Very recently, the CIA released documents 
uh, which are internal documents about the coup against Mossadegh between 1951 and 1953. And when you read it, you see that the US um, did a lot of the things, by the way, that they do today in countries like the Ukraine in 2014, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua. So one of the things they did was pay people to violently protest in Iran in order to cause chaos and uh, to try to delegitimize the prime ministership of Mohammad Mossadegh. And they were very clear that they wanted violent street protests in order to provoke Mossadegh into violently suppressing the protest. And then they could use that as a pretext to lead the military, which it had a huge uh, uh, influence over, to then overthrow Mossadegh. And again, we see this time and again in various countries throughout the world. The interesting part um, of this, and, and very sad part, was that ultimately the U.S., through Kermit Roosevelt, who was the CIA bureau chief, and through uh, their ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Iran, used old-time Persian hospitality to overthrow Mossadegh. So they were not able to get Mossadegh, who was a very nice guy and actually a very uh, passive guy. So he was not a guy that was apt to want to send in the military to attack protesters. So as a last-ditch effort, they went to Mossadegh, went to his house, and they said, these protesters are attacking Americans who are here in Iran. And they knew this would upset Mossadegh because Persians are very hospitable particularly to their guests. They don't want them any harm to come to them. He was greatly humiliated by this Mossadegh to know or to believe, though it wasn't true, that Americans were being attacked in Iran. So then he called on uh, Iranian forces to suppress the protesters in order to defend the Americans that he thought were being attacked. Wow. This was the pretext they needed, that they had been hoping for, that they had been working for. And this is when they send in General Zaghetti, who is their hand-picked guy, to go in and lead forces uh, to arrest Mossadegh and to overthrow his government. Um, but yeah, that is the story of, of Iran. And, and, and what's very interesting about it, it was the first CIA-led coup in the world. But it was a script that we would see played over and over again uh, throughout the years, including to this very day. Let's dig a little deeper into the Savak and, and the reign of terror under the Shah, because at the time, if I'm not mistaken, it was considered the most egregious human rights abuses in the world, uh, according yes. to Amnesty and some other human rights organizations. I mean, quite cynical, considering today we just continue to... Um, foment this, you know, hostility toward Iran based on alleged human rights abuses. Yeah, no, it's an incredible thing. So, first of all, let's go back a little to the guy they picked to replace Mossadegh as prime minister. So, they in 1953, the U.S. installed the Shah back as the monarch, but the guy they picked to be the prime minister, kind of the figurehead, um, then was a guy named General Zaghetti, and the reason they picked him. Uh, to be a leader in the new government was because he was the most anti-communist person they could find. And they knew this because he collaborated with the Nazis during World War II. So they picked an open Nazi collaborator to be part of the state in Iran. And in fact, shortly after the Shah came back to power, there were Nazi-like pageants in Tehran uh, that the Shah and his people uh, carried out. Um, but beyond this, uh, the CIA helped set up the SAVAK, uh, which again was the security apparatus which used both professional but also uh, civilian people to spy on everyone in society. 
Um, but they also used torture to keep the Shah in power. And the torture te techniques they used, they learned from the CIA. And the CIA had, in turn, borrowed those techniques from the Nazis. And so there was this real Nazi component to what was happening uh, with the Savak. And as you mentioned, in 1978, a year before the Shah was overthrown, Amnesty International said that Iran had the very worst human rights record on earth. And it was largely because of that Savak. And this had a lot to do with why the Islamic Revolution happened, the suppression of communists, the suppression of leftists, how the only organizing capabilities were pretty much done in mosques. Right. Um, so talk about, you know, the circumstances that led to 1979. Yes, the U.S., through its tactics, really, um, one, created the desire for revolution and also really determined the nature of how that revolution would be. Uh, because, as you mentioned, while Iran always had a very strong leftist uh, uh, segment of society, including communists in the, in the uh, form of the Tudor Party, which still exists today, um, as you said, the only place to safely politically organize under the Shah was in the mosques. And so it was the Islamicists who really became uh, the, the uh, predominant grouping in the revolution in 1979. That's not to say the left didn't participate in that, and I because I don't want to detract from what they did. They were particularly important in organizing workers to strike, particularly in the oil fields, etc. But in the end, um, it was the Islamic leaders, and particularly the Ayatollah Khomeini, who uh, became the chief leaders of the revolution that overthrew the Shah and became the leaders after the Shah was ousted. And then we see a lot happen. We see the hostage crisis, which the U.S. empire has never forgiven or forgotten. Um, then we see the horrific near-decade war, the Iran-Iraq war, which, of course, we were providing Saddam Hussein with the chemical weapons that we later wanted to invade Iraq yes. over. Um, which ended and culminated with the U.S. shooting down that civilian airliner, yes. which we still refuse to apologize Killing for. Killing about 300 people, mm -hmm. in which the Iranians have never forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think it's important to say a few things about those events. First of all, the hostage-taking, which took place uh, in 1980, uh, was precipitated by the U.S. inviting the Shah, who had been overthrown, to receive medical treatment in the United States. And the last time the Shah had been invited and hosted outside the country was in the 50s when they reinstated him and overthrew Mosaddegh. So this caused a lot of fear mm -hmm. that the U.S. was going to try another coup type situation. And so some students on their own uh, took over the embassy and took people hostage. It was not the government that did it, though the government ultimately um, ended up supporting that effort, in part to maintain their own kind of street cred. Uh, but the one interesting thing was that the hostage takers let all the women go and all the people of color. They only held the white guys, <laughs> um, which is kind of funny. But the other interesting thing about that was that, um, and that a lot of people don't realize, is that Ronald Reagan, who was running for president at the time, uh, his campaign people, through friends in the CIA, um, and through the uh, Mossad in Israel, uh, were able to maneuver uh, to, one, undercut Carter's ability to negotiate the release of the hostages and to convince the Iranian government to hold the hostages until after the 1980 elections so that Ronald Reagan would win the election. Uh, he had worked behind the scenes to actually have them held longer which is an incredible thing. Yeah. One would think that people would be pretty upset about this. And yet, even people who know it don't, don't seem to care that much. But So that's an interesting thing. And then the other thing that you mentioned is the U.S. supported Saddam Hussein to invade Iran. 
And this began the eight-year Iran-Iraq war, which was brutal. There, a million people in total were killed um, uh, in Iran and Iraq, total between the two countries. The U.S. at some point also begins arming Iran. So at some point in the Iran-Iraq war, the U.S. is arming both sides for two reasons. One, because it also wanted to, de- well, it wanted Hussein to win and to topple the Islamic Republic. It also didn't want Hussein to become too strong. So it wanted to wound both sides of the conflict. But also recall, again, as part of Reagan's chicanery, that Congress twice cut off USA to the Contras in Nicaragua. And so to get around that cutting off of aid, Reagan sold arms to Iran during this period to get cash to give to the Contras. This became the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, But I think the main point there, at least for the discussion of Iran, is that the U.S. supported both sides of that conflict, which is particularly a nefarious thing to do. And again, the Iranians don't forget this. The other point that needs to be made is that while Saddam was attacking Iran with chemical weapons, and while Iran had some chemical weapons that it, they inherited from the Shah, they never used them against Iraq because the Ayatollah then issued a fatwa at that time against the use of chemical weapons as being against Islamic law. <laughs> and so the Iranians took it. They took that abuse, that cruelty of the chemical weapons at the hands of Saddam, but they would not retaliate in kind. Which says a lot about the Iranian people and the Iranian government even, you know, the restraint that they showed at that time. Well, oddly enough, I mean, Trump is basically bringing back some of the most sadistic figures from this era, from this nefarious era, right? We have Elliot Abrams. Who's part um, of the Iran-Contra scandal. Part of the right. Iran-Contra scandal hid weapons on aid shipments. I mean, you could not make this up. Um, and you have John Bolton, of course, as you mentioned. I mean, he, from the day he was born, he's wanted nothing more than to obliterate Iran. Um, where do you think this is going to go here? Because it seems like, you know, obviously Trump wouldn't have picked people like Pompeo, like John Bolton, like Elliot Abrams if he didn't want to really move forward with this. But it does seem like he's kind of treading, you know, lightly considering it's his first term. He knows how detrimental and devastating it would be to have a full-blown war with Iran. Do you think a real war with Iran is a possibility if he does win a second term? I think it's a possibility. It's maybe even a possibility before the 2020 Mm. elections. The problem with Trump, I think, is he's a Brinksman. I think he is reckless. But the danger with that, if you're a Brinksman, is that ultimately someone's going to call your bluff, and then what do you do? Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, a war could happen even accidentally. Right, the precarious situation that they've put all of us in. That is absolutely right. And so look, I think a war with Iran is possible. I think largely our own military does not want it, realizes the dangers of it. Um, But I think it's possible given, again, the people that are in positions to make that happen. And that's why the American people really have to oppose this and make it clear they don't want this, and make it clear they're not going to reward Trump with another term if he engages in a war, You know, which a lot of presidents think is a recipe <laughs> to win re-election, to get us into a war, that, one, you know, that war presidents are re-elected. And we have to make it clear we don't want another situation like that. Mm-hmm. Well, you've spoken to many leftists, communists, inside of Iran. And, you know, it's hard for Americans to conceive how you can oppose U.S. militarism while still supporting progressive movements in other countries. Um, What what would your message be from them? Yeah, well, again, the folks I've talked to there, including folks in the Tudor party, are very clear. They don't like the Islamic government. They're secular socialists. You know, why would they like the Islamic Republic? And the Islamic Republic has been very repressive of leftists uh, within that country. But their position is uh, it's up to them to make political change in Iran. 
They will take care of that. What they need Americans to do is to keep the United States from destroying their country before they're able to make that political change. It's not up to us as Americans to determine Iran's political fate. It's not up to our own government to do that. The Iranians have to do that. And the irony here is that every time the U.S. ratchets up pressure on Iran, it actually destroys the reform movements in that country because it actually gives the more hardliners grounds to go after those people. And so the U.S. is not doing those people any favors by ratcheting up sanctions and military threats. In fact, they're undermining the ability of Iran and the Iranian people to chart their own course politically. Um, and by the way, I don't think that's by accident because the U.S. doesn't want reform in Iran. It wants the whole enchilada. It wants to get rid of the government that's in power now and to replace it with uh, really a puppet government of its own, like the Shah. Um, and so it is more than happy to do things to increase the power of the hardliners, which then justifies the U.S. in the minds of Americans to go after Iran. Mm -hmm.